Welcome everyone, my name is John Paul Jones and I'm the Dean of the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences. And thank you. <laughs> Once again, we're really gratified to see such a great response to these uh, downtown lectures on happiness. Uh, thank you so much for, for coming tonight. Um, last week we heard uh, Dr. Esther Sternberg talk about place and space and happiness. And tonight, uh, Dr. Uh, David Reichlin will be talking to us about uh, exercise and happiness, uh, which uh, I'm sure we can all get into that. It just depends on what your definition of exercise is. <laughs> Apologies to Bill Clinton for that joke. Um, I want to give a, a shout out to uh, Betsy Bolding, uh, who helped us uh, organize our overflow facility at uh, TEP Unisource. Thank you, Betsy. <laughs> SBS advisory board member. Uh, also uh, to uh, Arizona uh, Public Media for um, broadcasting these events live, uh, not only over there, but also uh, to uh, everyone uh, all over town who uh, couldn't make it here tonight and also to the Fox Theater, this uh, magnificent historic building that uh, we're in tonight. You know, if it weren't for the hard work of the people who uh, restored this building and who supported it, people like uh, Neelam and uh, Gulshan Seti, uh, who worked very hard to save this building and who have been uh, here every single one of these nights. We might all be uh, uh, parking here instead of attending lectures. So thank you very much. I'd also like to thank our health and wellness partners, uh, Miraval Arizona uh, Spa and Resort, um, Molly Stranahan from the Path to Happiness, where uh, if you go visit her, uh, you can find your own personal path to happiness. And, and while I'm mentioning Molly, I should also like to mention um, Elise Collins Shields and also Chris Segrin, Segrin from the uh, Department of Communication. All three of these uh, fine people gave up uh, afternoons to hear draft runs of the uh, talks that you're hearing tonight and thereby made them a, a much more special uh, talks through their comments and, uh, and the time and effort that they spent to, to help uh, our speakers uh, get organized. So thanks to uh, all three of you for that extra uh, time that you spent with us. <laughs> Kyria Sabin from Body Works Pilates is uh, uh, also a, sp a sponsor and a special sponsor of tonight's lecture because it's on exercise. Uh, she recently wrote me a little note and said uh, that uh, Pilates was very important for me getting uh, an attitude of gratitude to the 70 trillion cells in my body. <laughs> Thank you, Kyria. Um, and uh, also to the EOS Foundation for their work on the wellness of uh, children. Our downtown sponsors, Janos Wilder of Downtown Kitchen and Cocktails, Richard and Shana Oserin of Maynard's Market, which is now open, and Kitchen, and Patricia Schwabe of Pinka, and also um, my friends uh, Diana Tolton and uh, Vicki Jacobs of Tierra Antigua uh, Realty. Thank all of you for your sponsorships. <laughs> Our lead sponsors have been, as you know, the Arizona Daily Star and the SBS Magellan Circle, and I'm very grateful to all of them, but also, uh, especially tonight, uh, the Tucson uh, Medical Center um, which was an earlier adopter, an early adopter of the series, and uh, who immediately said yes upon uh, a description of the series. And I'd like to invite uh, Julia Strange, who is the vice president for community benefit, up to say a few words on behalf of TMC. Julia. <laughs> Julia, I want to thank you very much for your support. Julia is the lead person for. Uh, corporate relations, government relations, uh, strategic communication and community outreach. Uh, under her leadership, they've established a Department of Wellness in TMC, and it reflects both their uh, broad view of health and wellness and also their, uh, their commitment to our local community. So uh, thank you very much, Julia, for, for uh, TMC support. Um, I have a confession to make. It wasn't such a quick decision. I got the email or the phone call that said, 
we want you to sponsor this happiness thing downtown. And I thought, well, gosh, I don't know about that. And I quickly triaged it to one of my colleagues, <laughs> thinking that I would never hear about happiness again. And then um, a couple weeks later, she came back to me and she said, you know, we should really do this. This is a, this is a big deal and it's a, it's a good place for us to be. Um, so we're happy to partner with the UA College of Social and Behavioral Sciences to produce the downtown lecture series on happiness. Um, the, your research on people's behavior as well as how people relate to each other in the world around them um, is transformative and it will help us improve the wellness of our community. It's evident that happiness is strongly linked to health and as Tucson Community Hospital, as you mentioned, we are very focused on supporting activities that will improve the health outcomes as well as the quality of life for all Tucsonans. We are in the midst of a transformative, in a transformative phase in healthcare. We are moving from sick care to actual health care. And I think um, educating and empowering ourselves with information like we've heard throughout this series is part of that transformation. So we're th thrilled to be here. Um, this is part of how we're going to transform our health care system, our communities, and truly become um, a very healthy and well place to be. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And now it's a great pleasure of mine to introduce uh, Dr. David Reichlin uh, from SBS's School of Anthropology. David is a biological anthropologist um, who studies primates and, their, uh, and the role of evolution in making us uh, who we are. He received his undergraduate degree from Duke University in biological anthropology and anatomy and his master's and PhD degrees are from the University of Texas at Austin. And after that, he went to uh, what is a very famous uh, primate group working out of Harvard University before joining the U of A in 2006. He's um, got a long list of publications and journals I cannot uh, begin to pronounce. Um, also funding from the Leakey Foundation and also uh, primarily from the, from the National Science Foundation, but uh, perhaps of uh, greatest interest to uh, the people assembled here is that David is one of the most uh, popular press uh, items that we have in the College of uh, SBS. He's um, internationally known. His work has been featured in the, uh, by the BBC, uh, by the New York Times, by NPR, by Scientific American, and by National uh, Geographic, and um, by the Huff Post, and also Runner's World. Um, David's uh, if you were to just summarize it, his work is on the gate and uh, the role of the gate uh, in evolution. Uh, not only how we walk and how lengthy our steps are, but how we swing our arms. Essentially, everything having to do with locomotion and what it means to make us human is, is the central question uh, that he uh, has sought to answer in, in all of his work. And the relationships there, they deal with brain size, with obesity, with diet, with population density, um, with uh, happiness, and, um, and with things like uh, endocabinoid uh, signaling. But I, I think you knew that. Okay, so uh, <laughs> please join me in welcoming David Reichlin. Thank you so much, JP, for that introduction. And thank you all for coming out here tonight. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be a part of this lecture series, and I'm, I'm so excited to get to share with you some of the research we've been doing at the U of A, looking at these relationships between exercise and our brain, and how exercise can actually change the way that we feel. And we found some surprising things. I'm gonna share those with you tonight. But before I share some of the surprising things, I wanna discuss probably the most unsurprising thing you're gonna hear in the whole lecture series, and that's that exercise is good for us, <laughs> right? You all know this. We've heard it countless times. We've heard it from people like this, our doctors. We've heard it from the media, friends, family. Exercise is good for us. But despite knowing all of the benefits of exercise, despite knowing how good for us exercise is, not very many of us actually do it. So these are data from a recent Gallup poll 
uh, showing the percentage of Americans that engage in the recommended amount of exercise. That's about 30 minutes a day, five days a week. And no matter how you slice up the data, uh uh-oh, there we go. No matter how you slice up the data up here from the Gallup poll, by age, gender, whatever, um, only about 30% of us engage in the recommended amount of exercise. That's not very many. So how do we improve participation rates in exercise? This is a key public health question of our time. And just knowing the benefits of exercise doesn't seem to be working, right? That doesn't seem to get us out the door. So what can we do? Well, I think one place to start is just ask people who exercise why they do it, right? Kind of an obvious thing to do. Why is it that some people get out the door every morning and engage in this behavior that we know is so good for us? And if you do that, what you start to find is that, well, people start to exercise because they know it's good for them. They want to improve their health. But that's not why they keep exercising. They keep exercising because they say they enjoy it. They say it makes them happy. This is kind of bizarre, right? You can move your body and it can make you happy. So people have studied this. And when psychologists have studied this in in some detail, what they find is that people who engage in exercise come back to the same kinds of statements about how exercise makes them feel. Exercise seems to reduce their stress. Exercise seems to lead to a calming feeling. Exercise leads to a feeling of well-being. In some very rare cases, exercise leads to euphoria. Probably most people in here think that's crazy, but, but it happens. And the popular media has taken these changes in mood that are associated with exercise and coined a term for them, and that term's the runner's high. Now, the runner's high is not something that we generally use in the scientific literature, but I'm going to use it tonight as sort of a shorthand for these important changes in mood that happen when people exercise. Okay, so I, I kind of like to take a step back when I'm thinking about this and, and really think about how amazing it is that you can move your body and that can have an effect on your brain. That's an amazing thing. And it, I think it's possible that if more people felt this, right, if more people felt the runner's high, that more people would do this with their free time as opposed to doing what most of us do with our free time, which is this, right? <laughs> so, and this, this is not a lot of exercise, although your thumb can get really strong doing this. So how, how can we sort of, how can we get more people to feel this runner's high? How can we get more people to change their mood with exercise? And what is the runner's high? In order to explain and and figure out how we can get more people to feel this, we need to know something about how and why it occurs. Now, as JP mentioned, I'm an anthropologist. Um, I'm an evolutionary biologist. And when I ask questions like, why do some people enjoy exercise? Why do people get the runner's high? I fall back on a very famous quote from a very famous evolutionary biologist. Dobjansky said, that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And I find this to be a very powerful quote. Nothing in biology makes sense. Nothing in human biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. So if we want to know something about why people get the runners high, from my perspective, we need to know what it is about our evolutionary history that explains the runners high. And if we take this view, it means that perhaps we evolved to exercise, that perhaps exercise was actually a part of our evolutionary history. Now, this idea sort of runs contrary to the stories we've been told about exercise over the last few decades, sorry, the stories we've been told about evolution over the last few decades. We've been told stories of human evolution that end with a triumph of brains over brawn. Right? We've been told a story where over our evolutionary history, our brains expanded that led to great cognitive complexity, and we didn't need to use our bodies anymore, right? We didn't need the athleticism that we may have needed very early on. And if you look around the room tonight, if you look around Tucson, if you look around the US, you can probably agree with that. We don't look like athletes. We have big brains, we're very smart, but we really don't look like athletes. And I think that's especially true if we compare ourselves to some of the great natural athletes. Animals like cheetahs and gazelles who are so clearly shaped by evolution to be these amazing athletes. But I'd like to convince you by the end of tonight that that we did evolve as athletes. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> I always feel bad for the cheeto when I show that. <laughs> so I think we did evolve as athletes. I'd like to convince you of that, but not the kind of athletes that we see like a cheetah or a gazelle, but we evolved as endurance athletes. And not only was endurance athleticism important to our evolution, but the story of human evolution was not pitting brains against brawn. I think the story of human evolution was the linkage between brains and brawn. It was tying together our minds and bodies. And this linkage, I think, evolved fairly early in our evolutionary history. And that's the story I want to share with you tonight. I want to share with you the story of human evolution from this linkage of brains and brawn perspective. So to do that, I'm going to tell you a few different stories to get there. I'm going to start by talking about this evolutionary history and our evolutionary history as aerobic endurance athletes. And then I'd like to talk about some of the research we've done at the U of A showing that the link between our mind and body, the link between exercise and happiness, may actually have been a key element of this evolutionary history. And then using those two ideas, those two concepts, I'd like to try to answer the question, why is it that some people don't like to exercise? If we evolve to exercise and, it's, and, and we seem to evolve to enjoy it, why do so many of us not do it? But before we get to that big question, we need to start with our evolutionary history. So I want to take you way back in time, early in our evolutionary history, seven to eight million years ago. This was about the point where our lineage diverged from the lineage leading to our closest living relative, the chimpanzee. And at this time, for a few million years, we start to see some amazing fossils showing up in the fossil record of Africa. We see things like Ardipithecus, beautiful skeleton. More recently, we see, uh, we see skeletons like th this one, Australopithecus. This is the famous Lucy skeleton. And this is a really complex, uh, very rich fossil history at this point in time. I'm going to boil it down to something very simple, though. Um, and I'm, gonna, I'm going to tell you that from seven to two million years ago, we were basically bipedal fruit-eating apes. There were a lot of other little things going on, but in general, we, stood, we walked upright, just like we do. Our ancestors walked upright, but we, their lives were very similar to the fruit-eating apes. And then something happened around two million years ago. Around two million years ago, we start to see new fossils pop up in Africa. These look very different than these fruit-eating apes. These look much more like humans. And we think what happened was a major change in lifestyle beginning two million years ago. We think we went from being a bipedal fruit-eating ape to a hunter and gatherer. This was a key change in our evolutionary history. And it was likely driven by a major climatic event. So prior to two million years ago, much of Africa, the parts of Africa that our ancestors lived in looked like this. Heavy forests, which was perfect if you were a fruit-eating ape. There were lots of fruit around. There were lots of opportunities to eat. You could climb the trees. Life was good. But beginning around two and a half million years ago, the climate began to change. The earth began to cool. And these places in Africa where our ancestors lived began to dry up. And they started to look much more like this. This kind of a landscape poses a problem if you're a fruit-eating ape. It's hard to find fruit here. So some of our ancestors, we think, made a big change. They transitioned to a new lifestyle. They began to hunt. And we know this is true because at about the same time you start to see these new fossils at two million years ago, you start to see evidence of prey animals nearby our, our ancestors. These are bones from antelope. And where those white arrows are, are marks on the bones. Those marks were made by tools that our ancestors invented to butcher to eat meat. So they actually cut meat off these bones and we can see evidence of that in the fossil record. And not only are, are these just any bones that they may have scavenged from a, a lion or a hyena, these bones had really good meat on them. And so they, they were getting primary access to really good pieces of meat. So our ancestors were hunting at this time, at two million years ago. But how did they get their meat? Well today, hunters and gatherers use projectile weapons to get meat. This is a really safe way to do it. You don't have to walk up to an antelope and risk being kicked in the face. But two million years ago, there were no projectile weapons. They hadn't been invented yet. They had, they weren't, projectile weapons weren't really invented until about a half a million years ago. So for a million and a half years, our ancestors were capable of hunting without projectile weapons. How did that happen? 
Well, the story of how that happened is really the story that I want to tell tonight, our evolution as endurance athletes. In the mid-80s, Dave Carrier and later Dennis Bramble and Dan Lieberman suggested kind of an absurd idea for how our ancestors gained access to meat. They suggested they used a technique called persistence hunting, where you use a combination of endurance running and walking to force prey animals into heat exhaustion. So they suggested we basically ran animals down two million years ago. Right? This is absurd. This was sounded absurd to me. This probably sounds absurd to many of you if you haven't heard this before. But I want to show you some of the evidence that, uh, that supports this, that suggests it's plausible and, and possible for humans to do this. And the first piece of evidence is a great place to go whenever you need evidence of something happening in the natural world, David Attenborough. So David Attenborough filmed a persistence hunt from, uh, of San hunter-gatherers living in southern Africa. And in this video, you're seeing these kudu run across the screen. These are kudu that, the hunter, that these hunter-gatherers hunted using this ancient technique. And what you'll see are the San using a combination of endurance running, and sometimes they need to walk and track the animals. But what they're trying to do throughout this hunt is to force the prey animals to gallop. And the reason for that, you'll see them in the heat of the day here, they're going to scare this animal and force it to gallop. Quadrupeds can't thermoregulate when they gallop. They need to pant to offload heat. And if you keep them galloping, they can't pant. We can sweat. So we can always thermoregulate when it's hot. So if you do this right, over many hours, sometimes over days, you can force these large prey animals into heat exhaustion. And when they succumb to heat exhaustion, they become very docile. And at this point, you can walk up to them without much fear and without much, um, without much danger. So the idea behind persistence hunting is that using this amazing endurance capability that, that we seem to have, we're able to force animals into heat exhaustion and hunt them from a close range. And I don't want you to think that it's just hunter-gatherers that have the capability to run with these large prey animals. If you go to Wales today, you can see a horse versus human foot race. Over 30, 40, 50 kilometers, humans can run with the best horses in Wales. Right? Sometimes humans win. Maybe a third to a half, half, the, half the races humans win. And it's not just crazy Welshmen that are able to do this. Right? <laughs> this happens here in Arizona, in Prescott, Arizona, every October. There's a horse versus human foot race. You can go watch it. You can be a part of it if you want. And over about a, a marathon distance, 25 miles or so, humans do pretty well. In fact, just this past October 5th, a human came in second out of 20 horses and 23 humans. <laughs> yeah, that deserves applause. That's great. <laughs> nice work. So, so we're capable of these amazing feats of endurance. We're capable of huge, amazing physiological feats. And we think that we evolved skeletal adaptations and physiological adaptations to support these endurance feats. And there's, I think, good evidence from the fossil record that these adaptations for endurance activity evolved around two million years ago. Up on the screen on your left is Lucy, our pre-hunting and gathering ancestor. And on the right is our first hunter-gatherer, Homo erectus. They look pretty different. Over the last few years, many of us have put together lists of traits that we think are adaptations for long distance running and walking. And I'm not going to go through all these, I don't want to bore you too much, but I will go through a couple. One important trait that seems to have happened, seems to have evolved, that we still have today, are very long legs and large joints in our legs, large knees and hips. And that helps us move faster, both running and walking, and those large joints are able to absorb those higher forces that you get at high speed. We also have a really unique tra trait. We have a ligament in our neck called the nuchal ligament. It attaches our skull to our neck. And it stabilizes our head when we move at high speeds. And the important thing about the nuchal ligament is that no other primate has this trait. The other animals that have this trait are horses, gazelles, antelope, dogs. So we share a trait with endurance running mammals that no other primates have. So combining our amazing feats of endurance today with these skeletal traits, I think there's very good evidence that endurance athleticism was an important part of our evolution. We evolved as endurance athletes, and we still have the traits to prove it today. But like everything with evolution, there are problems, there are trade-offs, nothing's ever simple. 
We know some of the problems with endurance activities. You can probably think of them right now. Endurance activities make you tired, right? They're energetically costly. They're fatiguing. It's not just for us. It's costly and fatiguing for other endurance mammals to run. These are sled dogs. They're exhausted, right? It's hard. In addition to being tiring and energetically costly, endurance activities carry an injury risk, both long-term and short-term. Right? You can roll your ankle, you can fall, you can create some problems in the short run that are not a big deal if you can catch a ride home from Reed Park, but they're a big deal if you're in the middle of Tanzania. So about five or six years ago, I started to think a lot about these problems with endurance exercise and was trying to figure out how can evolution get us to do an activity with so many costly problems. Now, it's obvious why you might get out the door. You're going out to go find food, but how does evolution overcome these problems to keep our ancestors running hour after hour, day after day? And to me, that posed a unique challenge to evolution. How do you make something inherently unpleasant, like exercise, into something that could actually be bearable or maybe even enjoyable? How can you do that? And this is important when you realize we use endurance exercise during foraging, but it's also important when you realize that many animals use endurance exercise when the tangible reward, that food reward, is not immediate, right? Mammals use endurance exercise during migration, during short distance travel. As we all know, very bizarre ones use it for recreation. So how does, how does evolution overcome these problems to get us to exercise? And I started to think that the answer to that question came back to the original question I posed, which is, why do some people exercise? Perhaps evolution actually made exercise enjoyable by reducing our stress, by making us feel calm, by making it feel good, by making us happy, by giving us the runner's high. So I asked what I thought was, at the time, was a pretty simple question. Turns out it's not so simple. But is it possible that evolution used the runner's high to actually encourage our ancestors to run, to exercise. Is that a possibility? Um, and I want to take a moment now to, to say that obviously no work like this, no, none of these kinds of studies happen by just one person doing them. I, I was able to assemble an amazing group of colleagues, neurobiologists, physiologists, anthropologists from around the country, Brooke Keeney and Ted Garland, Greg Gerdeman, uh, Andrea Giuffrida, Alexander Sellier, and one of my grad students, Adam Foster. And we got together and started thinking about how can we answer this question? How can we figure out whether the runner's high evolved to actually encourage our ancestors to exercise? To answer that question, we actually needed to start by figuring out what's the runner's high? What causes it? And when I say what causes the runner's high, probably one word jumps into your mind, right? What's that word? Endorphins, right. Everyone knows endorphins cause the runner's high. Um, so it turns out that may not be quite right. Um, you're probably not surprised to hear me say that. Um, when I first started working on this problem, there actually was not a lot of scientific evidence that endorphins were responsible for the runner's high. There's a little bit more evidence now. But because there wasn't much evidence five or six years ago, we started looking into another group of compounds that are similar to endorphins in some ways, and these are endocannabinoids. Endocannabinoids are neurotransmitters, like endorphins in a, in a sense, they're basically our body's form of marijuana. They, when we generate them, they activate cannabinoid receptors on our neurons, and that generates feelings of reward, feelings of happiness that are actually very similar to the kinds of things that runners describe. When we started this study, we, we noticed that some recent work had shown that endocannabinoid levels actually increase following distance running and another aerobic activity, cycling, um, and th these are the data from that study showing before and after endocannabinoid levels um, following these exercise bouts. Unless you think that these increases in endocannabinoids come because these people were just excited to be sitting in a lab, they actually measured endocannabinoids in people sitting in a lab and they went down. Uh, <laughs> all my graduate students can tell you that's exactly what happens when you sit in a lab too long. So because of this, because endocannabinoids increase following exercise, we wanted to find out whether perhaps evolution could use endocannabinoids to motivate animals to exercise. 
We know cannabinoids can motivate some people to do things, but can evolution actually use this system to motivate animals to exercise? To answer that question, we chose sort of an odd model. We chose to look at mice first. Um, we don't generally think of mice as endurance running mammals, but we worked with a very unique group of mice. We worked with some mice that are part of an evolution experiment that Ted Garland out at UC Riverside has been performing since the mid 90s. And he's been trying through a sort of a, a laboratory evolution experiment to generate distance running mice. So he started out with a bunch of mice. He gave them access to a running wheel. You can see what the running wheels look like up there. And uh, he took the mice that ran the most and started breeding them. Generation after generation, he bred the mice that ran the most. And he ended up generating mice that ran 12 to 15 kilometers a day, voluntarily. That's up to nine miles a day. And that's just a little mouse, right? <laughs> if you scale up that mouse to the size of us, to a human size, that's like us running up to Casa Grande every day. It's a long way. So I want to show you a little video of the mice. You could probably guess which is which, but the selected mouse is up on the left. The regular mouse is not really running, right? It's up on the right. We wanted to know why the mouse ran so much. Did it enjoy the running wheel? That could be why. <laughs> it never ends. <laughs> okay, we thought, well, that's a possibility. Maybe it just liked riding the wheel around. But what we really wanted to know, was it possible that in this evolution experiment, the endocannabinoid system was targeted? That what was happening was endocannabinoids were being upregulated to a great degree in the running mice to motivate them to run because it felt so good. So how do you test this? We tested it by looking at what happens when you turn off this system. What happens to these mice if you can turn off the system? It turns out there's a drug called Ramonabont that if you take it, it temporarily blocks cannabinoid receptors so that you can produce endocannabinoids, but you won't get those rewarding sensations. You're probably thinking, who would create a drug like this? <laughs> um, it turns out it was created for weight loss because another side effect of activating your cannabinoid receptors is that you get hungry. The technical term for that is actually the munchies. <laughs> so I had to get some kind of marijuana joke up here, right? <laughs> OK, so if you take Ramona Bond, you can block these receptors. So what happens to our mice when we do this? This is uh, the plot I'm going to show you shows how much our mice, the, the endurance running mice and, and just regular control mice ran when they took a placebo and then how much they ran when they took Ramona Bond. And here's what happened with the placebo. Obviously, as you could guess, the running mice run a lot farther than the control mice. But when you block their cannabinoid recept receptors with, with Ramona Bond, here's what you get. Right? You get a drastic decrease in wheel running. And that decrease is just enormous in our running mice. So what we think was going on as part of this experiment was endocannabinoids were being upregulated in the mice, and that was actually an evolved response to the selection experiment. So it's possible that evolution can encourage long-distance running by making you produce more endocannabinoids. Is this what happened in humans? Does this concept sort of answer our original question of whether evolution used the runner's high to encourage our ancestors to exercise? Did evolution upregulate endocannabinoids in humans when we run? That's a trickier question to answer. Um, and the way we went about answering that and, and are starting to answer that is that we looked at what happens in humans when they run and what happens in other endurance running mammals when they run. Do other endurance runners get an endocannabinoid effect from running? And then compare those responses to what happens in animals that clearly did not evolve to run. That, if we see some kind of similarity in our running mammals, then we have some evidence that this is an evolutionary effect. So to do this study, we chose to look at human runners. We also chose another mammal that we know evolved to run long distances, the dog. And we needed to compare these endurance runners to a mammal that we know did not evolve to run long distances. And so for that, we chose the ferret. Um, I, my apologies to ferret owners and ferret lovers out there. I, I love ferrets. Um, but uh, they are not endurance runners. They're not marathon runners. So if it's true that evolution used endocannabinoids to motivate running through these, through these effects, through these runner's high effects, then we think we can make a few predictions. 
First, that we should see increases in endocannabinoids in our running mammals, in the humans and the dogs. And we should not see an increase in endocannabinoids after exercise in ferrets, in our non-running mammal. And another possibility is that if this is true, if, if the runner's high evolved to motivate us to exercise, then we should only get these endocannabinoid increases after the kinds of intensities that are targeted by evolution. So after running, but not after something low intensity like walking. So to test this model, to test these predictions, we recruited uh, a lot of runners from the Tucson community. Hopefully some of you are out here tonight. Uh, but we had a great response from the Tucson community. We also recruited pet owners from the Tucson community. So hopefully some of you are out here tonight. We didn't recruit ferrets from Tucson, um, but we did adopt them out after the study was done. So in every part of this experiment, uh, the Tucson community was extremely supportive. Um, and we, we brought our subjects in and had them run and walk on a treadmill for about 30 minutes. Um, they ran, all, our subjects ran at heart rates that were about 70% of their maximum, so a fairly moderate intensity. They walked at heart rates that were about 50% of their maximum. That's a pretty low intensity. That's what you'll feel like when you're walking out of here tonight. And we took blood samples and looked at what happened to endocannabinoids before and after these exercise bouts. And here's what we found. Here's our human runners. Uh, these are endocannabinoid levels in yellow before exercise and blue after exercise. And just like the previous study I showed you, endocannabinoid levels roughly triple following exercise. So we get a pretty good boost in endocannabinoids after exercise. We wanted to see whether this endocannabinoid change was associated with how people felt. So we gave our subjects a mood questionnaire. And we looked at how mood changed from before to after exercise, that's on the vertical axis, compared to how endocannabinoid levels changed on the horizontal axis. You can see a pretty nice association between whether you have a large increase in endocannabinoids and whether you have a big increase in mood. In fact, this guy up here, he didn't want to get off the treadmill, right? He, had a, <laughs> he was having a good time. So endocannabinoid levels increase greatly following exercise in humans. That seems to be associated with an increase in mood. What about dogs? Dogs, this is Max. Max was one of our dogs. That's what a dog treadmill looks like. Um, Max, like our other dogs, had a big increase in endocannabinoids following exercise, just like humans. So like we predicted, the two endurance running mammals got this large increase in endocannabinoids following exercise. What about our ferrets? The ferrets had no significant change in endocannabinoids following 30 minutes of running, right? So running did not lead to a significant boost in endocannabinoids. They didn't like the, the running that much. Okay, so our endurance running mammals get this boost in endocannabinoids. The non-endurance runners do not. What about low intensity exercise? We don't think that should be targeted by evolution. To, uh, to get this sort of runner's high. And in fact, in low intensity walking, humans don't get a boost in endocannabinoid levels. In low intensity walking, dogs actually get a significant decrease in endocannabinoid levels. We, we can't explain this right now, we're working on it, but what we can say is dogs certainly don't get a, any kind of increase in endocannabinoids following walking. Ferrets, Ferrets didn't like to walk on the treadmill. It was too slow, they kept jumping off, they're very inquisitive. So, <laughs> I don't have good walking data to show you, but I can show you what happens when they sit in their cage for a half an hour, and uh, they don't get a significant boost in endocannabinoids after that either. So, what does this tell us? I think this, this begins to shed light on an important story. This is just one study, it's just a few animals, few, few, few species. But I think we're starting to see evidence that when it comes to the runner's high, when it comes to exercise making you feel good, making you happy, your evolutionary history matters. That if you evolved to engage in this behavior, that evolution may have actually linked happiness with exercise to help that behavior as an adaptation. And because of that, the intensity that you exercise at matters. Right? It doesn't just happen at any intensity. It may be happening at intensities that were important for our evolution. So I want to show you some more data from our human sample as we changed exercise a bit more. So I'm going to show you a plot where changes in endocannabinoid levels um, are shown at four different intensities measured by uh, the percentage of your maximum heart rate. So at 50%, 70%, 80%, and 90% of our subject's maximum heart rates. 
A couple striking things. We knew that low intensity exercise didn't cause an endocannabinoid change, but very high intensity, running for 30 minutes at 90% of your maximum heart rate, did not lead to a change in endocannabinoid levels. Those changes only occurred at these moderate intensities, intensities that we're call, we, we call the sweet spot. These are moderate intensity exercise levels that can lead to endocannabinoid changes. So, based on this result, we started to think that perhaps the rewards that we get from exercise are targeted at the intensities that we use during foraging, at the intensities that evolution selected for foraging. And so, um, if this is true, this, we haven't proven this, but if this is true, it would mean that sweet spot is really an evolutionary sweet spot. We're starting to see some evidence for this. We're working with, actually, this group of hunter-gatherers. These are the Hadza, who live in northern Tanzania. They're the last big-game hunter-gatherers in Africa. And they've been wonderful enough to us to, to wear heart rate monitors when they go out and forage. So this is Brian Wood, one of my colleagues. Herman Ponser at Hunter College is another colleague working on this. And we've been measuring heart rates in, in hunter-gatherers as they forage. And I can tell you, with the data are still preliminary, but they don't stroll when they forage. They're not lollygagging. They exercise and forage at intensities that are similar to those that lead to an endocannabinoid uh, activation in, in the lab. So I think this means a couple of important things for us. One, this change in our aerobic activity, this change in our endurance behavior was a key element to our success on a changing landscape. It was the key element that allowed us to compete with some of the top predators in Africa beginning two million years ago. And I think, as I said, we haven't solved this, but I think we're shedding some light on the idea that perhaps exercise link, or evolution linked exercise and happiness to help us in this pursuit. So the changes in our mood that we feel may have actually been a key element to our evolutionary success two million years ago. If that's true, it means that the evolution of physical activity in humans, the evolution of exercise, changed our bodies, gave us long legs, gave us a nuchal ligament, gave us all sorts of other adaptations. But it may have changed our brains too. It may have really wired us to exercise in an amazing way. And just like we still have the, the skeletal and muscular effects of that evolutionary history today, we also have these wiring effects. The effects of exercise on our brain remain with us today. Decades of work, dozens of studies have shown that acute exercise improves your mood. And up until now, I've just been talking about walking and running, which is fair because that's what was available to our ancestors. They didn't have things like stair climbers and exercise bikes and ellipticals. But that doesn't mean that the effects of exercise on the brain only occur with running and walking. So I want to show you some data that what I think are these evolved responses to exercise are pretty generalizable to any kind of endurance activity as long as it's moderate intensity. So these are, I'm going to show you some data from a study where uh, individuals were given a mood questionnaire, just like we gave, and they were given this questionnaire before and after they exercised at a moderate intensity on any piece of equipment they wanted to choose. And here's what happens. When you go from before to after exercise, your mood goes up, and it stays up. Doesn't matter what you do, as long as it's moderate intensity, your mood stays up. And it turns out that you can accumulate many of these acute bouts of exercise and have a really large impact on your overall day-to-day -day mood. So here are data from a study where individuals were randomly assigned to a 15-week exercise group or a sedentary group where they just lived their normal sedentary lifestyle. And over that 15-week period, individuals in the exercise group saw a significant increase in their mood. And this is day-to-day -day mood, not just after exercise. So exercise can have powerful effects on our mood. The way that it does this, as I mentioned before, is exercise has effects on things like stress. It can reduce your stress. That's going to help you feel better. It can relieve anxiety disorders. Right? It, can, it can relieve these anxious feelings. Exercise can also have an effect on a very important mental health issue that we deal with today. Exercise can have a major effect on symptoms of mild depression. There's actually a study that just came out last week that reviewed prospective studies of exercise and depression. So people were measured at a baseline, and then they were measured again sometime in the future. And in 28 out of 30 prospective studies, the amount of activity someone engaged in at baseline predicted their depressive symptoms later on. 
So more active, they were less depressed at the follow-up. Less active at the baseline, they were more depressed at the follow-up. The Cochrane Collaboration. Cochrane Collaboration is the gold standard for evidence-based medicine recommendations in this country. They recently updated their statement on exercise and mild depression. And they said that exercise can lead to significant improvements in symptoms of mild depression of similar magnitude to the improvements you get from cognitive behavioral therapy and from prescription drugs. So exercise can be very powerful, and I think this powerful effect is part of our evolutionary history. So this brings us back to a key question. If exercise is good for us, exercise makes us happy, we evolved to do it, then why is it that so many people don't seem to like it? Why is it that some people clearly like to exercise and others do not? I wish I had a great answer for you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the punchline now. I don't have the answer for you. But I want to at least start putting this question into an evolutionary perspective because I think this type of work can speak to that question. So we evolved to exercise, but we evolved to exercise at a time where we were living on the edge of energy balance. Right? We were living at a time where we were bringing in just enough food to, to maintain our, our lifestyle. So when we didn't need to exercise to get food, there was a tremendous pressure to rest. There was a tremendous pressure to save energy. So not only did we evolve to exercise, but we also evolved to rest, and that's very powerful. Evolution is pretty complex in this way. Remember, the challenge to evolution was not getting us out the door to exercise. At least I think the challenge to evolution was how do you make this unpleasant behavior more bearable or more enjoyable? Well, getting out the door was a, was a very big motivation for hunter-gatherers, and that, that led to a lot of fitness, that led to a lot of, uh, a lot of exercise. Today, foraging is very different, right? Today, this is how we forage. We don't forage by having to go out and find our food on the savanna. The most exercise we get when we forage is really pushing a heavy shopping cart. That's not a lot of exercise. So we've lost a major impetus to, to get fit, to be physically active and to be physically fit. And what that means is that many of us just can't quite exercise at the intensities that are needed to elicit that endocannabinoid response. Many of us can't exercise at intensities that can overcome some of the unpleasant aspects of exercise. We can't get that response. And that's a shame because, as I mentioned early on, one of the great predictors of whether people adhere to exercise is whether it improves their mood. So if, you're, if, you, if people are not fit enough to get to that sweet spot, then they're not going to have that mood improvement and they're not going to adhere to an exercise program. So how can we start to change things? Just telling people exercise is good for you doesn't seem to do it. How do we start? I think one way to start is to rethink our conceptions of exercise. Right, right now, we think of exercise as a chore. We think of exercise as something we have to go do. We think of exercise as something that so, we want to put off so long, we're willing to take an escalator to a gym <laughs> when there are stairs right next door. So I think we think about exercise the wrong way. The evolutionary solution, I think, at least one way to consider it from this perspective, is that we need to be incorporating exercise more into our daily lives. Hunter-gatherers don't go to a gym. They exercise throughout the day. They get that activity throughout the day. That's how they stay fit. So we can start changing our approach to exercise by incorporating more moderate intensity exercise into our daily lives. And I, I know this is kind of cliche, and I'm going to get even more cliche, but there's a reason for it. So things that we can do, you've heard this all before, but you, it really can work. You can park further away from a building. You can take the stairs more often. You can have walking meetings. The reason I bring these up is not to be cliche, but because there's been quite a bit of recent evidence that shows that if you accumulate exercise in short bouts throughout your day, as long as it's at a moderate intensity, you can improve your aerobic fitness by 15, 20%. Those are huge gains just by walking a little more during the day at a moderate intensity. And as soon as you can do that, if you can accumulate 10-minute bouts of moderate intensity exercise throughout the day, 
You can actually improve your mood. These are, there are studies that have come out in the last few years showing very clear mood effects so long as you're at those moderate intensity levels. So whenever I give a talk like this and I talk about getting out the door and, and getting moderate intensity exercise, everybody asks what that means. What does moderate intensity actually mean? Well, we know what light intensity exercise is. That's when you walk out of here, you'll be walking out at a light intensity. You can talk, you can sing, and your breathing patterns didn't, don't, don't really change. Moderate intensity exercise happens when you, sort, when you speed up, when your breathing changes, and most importantly, when you can't sing anymore. So if you want to know whether you're at a moderate intensity exercise level, try singing. Um, and, it, and I should just point out, um, if you want more information, I, I do like to at least say there are places on the web, obviously, where you can go and calculate out what those moderate intensities are. I'm not a medical doctor. I'm, I'm a doctor, but not the kind that helps people. And so you should go to places, <laughs> you should go to places like the American Heart Association website to get these great tips on, on how to start. But I do want to bring, I want to, I want to sort of wrap things up and bring this story back to uh, the area of study that I, that I do perform, that I do enjoy the most. And that's our evolutionary history. And I think that if we go back two million years, high levels of endurance activity, high levels of aerobic exercise were a key element of our evolutionary success. They're what allowed us to adapt to a changing world. They're what allowed us to adapt when the forest dried up and the landscape became more open. And I think that this link between the mind and body was a key part of that evolutionary history. That the reason why exercise can make us feel so good today, we owe that to our evolutionary lineage. And so we can take advantage of that evolved response. We can take advantage of our evolutionary history and you can actually change your psychological state today. Change your psychological state today. You can find that sweet spot. You can go out of here and you can move yourself at a moderate intensity just like we evolved to do, and you can change the way you feel, and it can make you happier today. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I am inspired. <laughs> I just took six steps up here. <laughs> Moderate intensity. Moderate intensity. <laughs> uh, you can uh, probably catch David here in the lobby uh, if you have some burning questions. Otherwise, I encourage you to uh, go to our live chat sponsored by the Arizona Daily Star Friday at noon uh, to one uh, if you um, want to ask questions. Uh, you can uh, you can type them in on your um, working treadmill there at uh, there at the office. <laughs> Please join us next week for Dan Russell, uh, our last uh, in this uh, series. We hope to see all of you uh, uh, next Wednesday. Thank you very much for coming. Great, thank you, thank you very much. All right.